what's going on YouTube? It's your buddy Will from the What's Up in the Sky 37 channel or www.whatsupinthesky.com and welcome back to my space news. This one's for July 25th, 2014, Friday night. We've uh, got a couple good ones for you. We're going to be talking, I'm going to talk about this comet that's going to be passing Mars. It's coming really close within the Earth and the Moon. Um, from the Earth to the Moon, it's coming to Mars. This comet's going to pass within that you know, distance. So I'm also going to talk about, give you an update on the ISRO. If you watch my channel, you've been a subscriber for the last year or so. We've been watching the ISR, the ISRO Indians uh, space mission to Mars, the Mars orbiter mission. Um, also, there's another country throwing in their, uh, throwing in their, their ring to Mars. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Give you a quick curiosity update. Um, the road hazards threaten the rover. They're talking about the rover wheels some more. Um, and also, if you haven't seen this, uh, a couple of people put out videos about the giant UFO harvesting the energy from the sun. And, uh, of course, we've got a hit piece from the Huffington Post on it. And some interesting things as we go through. So just want to show you uh, this. This is basically what I'm doing with these space news. I'm, I'm going to give you... Uh, I'm getting articles. I get Google sends me them all day in my mailbox. I also get a lot of articles from you guys, just people who send me stuff. Say, hey, this might be interesting. So I pick the ones. I'm not going to do it every night. I might do it once a week, once a month, three, four, five times a week. Who knows? But see, people seem to like it. And also you get a little bit of the space news that we don't get everywhere else. So hopefully you guys have seen this. And if not, all the links to these articles will be in the description. Just check it. And this one's cool. I'm interested in this. I'm not going to read the whole articles, but I'll read a little bit about it. Um, in mid-October, a comet sweeping through our inner solar system for the first time will pass near Mars. So close, in fact, that if we're buzzing near Earth at the same distance, it would fly well outside our moon's orbit. And while material spewing from the icy visitor probably won't trigger the colossal meteor shower on the red planet that some scientists predicted, dust and water vapor may still slam into Mars, briefly heating up its atmosphere and threatening orbiting spacecraft. However, its effects on the planet and the comet should give scientists their closest view yet of a near-pristine visitor from the outer edges of our solar system. So this thing's coming from the outer edges. You know, I'm pretty sure that what they're saying is coming from the Oort cloud. It's coming on in, and it's going to come so close. It's coming with, you know, in between our moon. I mean, that that's close. Um, and there's a huge, you know, there's coma and stuff on this thing, which will be interesting to see what we see. We've got a lot of spacecraft down there. Uh, researchers quickly realized the object would pass near Mars. At first, when observations of the comet were sparse, its orbit wasn't well defined. They uh, suggested that the comet ice ball even had a small chance of striking Mars. Now, researchers estimate the comet will pass within 131,000 kilometers from the red planet on October 19th. All right, so October 19th, 2014, when it's going down. Um, very interesting. Now, the hazy cloud of dust and water vapor spewed from the ice ball's surface as it warmed would slam into Mars with a spectacular effect. In March, one team predicted a meteor hurricane on Mars, with billions of bits of dust streaking through the red planet's atmosphere each hour for about five hours. Now we realize the comet is much smaller than expected, uh, says Jermaine, an astronomer at the Institute of Celestial Mechanics. So basically they're saying now that it's it's not going to hit Mars, but it's coming pretty close. And... Uh, Comets can be unpredictable, and that they can. They can be very unpredictable. As we all watch with ISON, as a lot of people came, spewed doom and gloom, and my channel never gave you the doom and gloom on ISON. I said it was going to be a comet if we even get to see it, and it uh, ended up breaking up. So here we go. The comet's dust tail might, is, might not wash across Mars, but some of the coma's water and vapor is sure to strike the planet says Roger Yale, a planetary scientist at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Considering the relative velocities of Mars and the comet, that material will slam into the red planet's atmosphere at more than 57 kilometers per second, a process that will heat up the air, causing it to expand, fluffing upward to increase the atmosphere drag on craft orbiting the planet. This is where it gets kind of interesting to me. Um, thereby slowing down the orbiters slightly, but not substantially threatening them. Such physical changes to the atmosphere might last only hours or days, he notes, but any subtle chemical changes, including those resulting from the extra hydrogen added to the air when ultraviolet light breaks down the water vapor, will persist much longer. Any dust from comet siding spring that does, not strike, that does strike the planet would be small addition to the overall amount of dust in Mars' atmosphere, but in some regions, especially outside the Martian tropics, it could have a noticeable effects. Very, very interesting. So they're going to, uh, let's see here. Although Mars' atmosphere will protect the landers and rovers from speeding dust particles probes, orbiting the red planet might 
orbit is basically they're saying the orbiters might be at risk. The greatest danger will occur when Mars passes through the debris field, uh, the debris trail following the comet. The window of danger starts about 90 minutes after the comet's closest approach and will last between 20 and 30 minutes. Long before that time, NASA and other space agencies can adjust their satellites' orbits, such as craft swing behind Mars for protection during the brief intervals of highest threat. Planning for such adjustments is already underway, he notes. So basically, the uh, the orbiters are going to get tucked away. This shouldn't shouldn't really hurt anything, but we're going to get some amazing views. The high rise should be getting a great view of it, taking pictures the whole time. Um, even it says Curiosity rover might be able to get in on the act because Mars' atmosphere has no ozone to block the ultraviolet light sensors on the rover will be able to detect those wavelengths and therefore monitor certain traces gas spewing from the comet unless a dust storm blocks the view so very interesting i'm going to leave that link in there this is going to be cool so october 19th we'll be we're going to be on it so here at what's up in the sky news what's up in the sky.com we'll be watching it mars orbiter completes it. this is this is uh very exciting for me i've been like uh i'm so excited that that ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, has been in, I mean, they're lifting off satellites, they're sending stuff up, they're really, they're, they're NASA, ESA, now there's, they're not the only people in the ball game now. Other, other smart people and other smart countries are, are getting into this because it's going to be a huge industry. It's already brought prestige to India, just what they've done already. So this talks a little bit about the Mars orbiter completed its 80% of its journey. So it had to do a couple uh, couple maneuvers. I'll read this real fast to you. The first Indian Martian orbiter spacecraft is inching closer to the red planet and has more covered than more than 540 million kilometers, which is about 80% of its journey, and it has to cover just 20% of its journey for its rendezvous with the planet slated for September 24th. This is going to be an interesting day, the 24th. The spacecraft traveling for nearly eight months and carrying five instruments in its last lap, about 60 days from its celestial goal, ISR said on our SRO said on its social media site. Yes, that's very close to a whopping 80%. Um, and it's in good health, basically. Um, the last crucial milestone, ISR performed a second trajectory correction maneuver on the spacecraft on June 11th by firing the spacecraft's 22 Newton thrusters for 16 seconds. Mid-course corrections are done to keep the spacecraft on course. I mean, they're watching this thing as it goes, and they know it's so precise that they know, all right, we got to do it for 16 seconds. We got to use the thrusters. I mean, it, it's just amazing how... Uh, how this stuff works and, and i'm hoping it works out another trajectory connection maneuver is planned for august before the isr performs the mars orbit insert or insertation insertation what do i say there insertion <laughs> in september so basically that's going to be the hard part that's where the esa has had problems a lot of other people have had problems getting that that last little part is inserting it into the mars um, orbit and basically you're slowing down something you're sending it at full speed and uh to slow it down stick it in orbit it's a it's a hard task and i praise so far for what they've done uh, they've proved that they can send it out they can send they can put satellites there a lot of people are using it um, are using the isro to launch their satellites their mini satellites so more power to them and we'll be we'll be watching that september 24th all right uae all right this is kind of cool i thought this was awesome um, basically, the United Arab Emirates has announced plans to launch a mission to Mars by 2021. At first, the Arab world. It's a first for the Arab world. The mission and accompanying space agency are a big deal for the UAE, scientifically and politically. Investing in space activities is not new territory for the UAE. Its investment in space-related technology has already exceeded some U.S. $5.4 billion. Developing satellite data, mobile satellite communications, and earth mapping and observation facilities. This is not surprising when we live in an age where space hardware is important for a range of practical everyday uses, such as telecommunications and navigation. According many, there we go. Accordingly, many countries have invested in purchasing satellites for their launches, data from space, and other space infrastructure. So, not too much about it. There's a little video down here that talks about it. 
but there's something unique about the UAE's announcement of plans to create a space agency and launch an unmanned mission to Mars by 2021. The plans indicate that the UAE will develop its own spacecraft building and perhaps its own launching capabilities, while many countries participate in the space activities through the purchase of hardware and launches from external providers like the ISRO, who's now who's now putting that up. The ability to build and launch their own craft domestically lifts the country to the next level of spacefaring elite. The announcement also implies the UAE plans to pursue hugely expensive space activities with primary scientific purpose. Yes, the project has practical purpose in that the inspire the UAE technology growth and education of the forthcoming scientists. However, a country is also making a statement when it moves from a space-related activity for purely practical purposes to more heady goals of exploration, inspiration, and science. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave this here for you so you can read it. Very interesting. Everybody's getting in the game. Um, why does everybody want to go to Mars? Probably because of what we've been seeing in our videos on Mars. Um, you know, the streets are of gold are on Mars. I, I keep hearing that here and there. So here we go. Curiosity update. This is from uh, a blog that I found, the Planetary Science the Society. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, lady talks a little bit here. I'm not going to go too much into it. But um, basically, we have it. If you looked at the SOL data, we're missing about three days. Nothing came down for three days. So for the last four weeks, the name of the game for Curiosity has been driving. But these weeks of driving have been more challenging than they used to be. Four of the drives in those last four weeks had ended unexpectedly early due to one problem or another. The lack of images returned so far from Sol 697 suggests another something happening this week. The shortened drives were on Sol 672, 676, 677, and 683. The reason for the premature end, prematurely ended drives vary, but they probably all have to do with the fact that the rover is moving into more complex terrain. Indeed, the Sol 672 drive curiosity took Curiosity exactly to the edge of her landing eclipse. Basically, this was where it took it to the edge. We are now at the edge of where, okay, it's a safe landing zone. If we can get it to land here, we're okay. So, and this is kind of interesting. If you've got your old glasses, um, check this check this out below. You can actually see in 3D, get your red and blue glasses out. I've got these. I always see, I like to look at the anomalies in the stereo pair, especially with the, uh, to see it in 3D, it helps pop. And I wish I could do my videos in 3D, but I know everybody doesn't have these glasses. Maybe there will be some I'll do at one point, but I'm going to leave that up for you. This is, she's, uh, I've been watching her blog for a while. She does a pretty good job. They don't talk about anomalies or anything like that, but more and more now, road hazards threaten the rover. As Curiosity rover chugs across the surface of Mars, mission scientists worry that wheel damage could cut the mission short. Curiosity is bound for Mount Sharp, a 5.5 kilometer high mountain surrounded by the water, altered sediments, and scientists want to probe for science of ancient life. I want to probe, I want to go up the mountain and look at what looks like a whole civilization that was up there one time. But its path takes across outcrops of hard, fractured rock formations, and the photo shows the sharp stones honed by the Martian wind are puncturing the wind's thin aluminum wheels. Why do we have thin aluminum wheels on the rover? It drives me insane. $2.5 billion. I know aluminum's a, a great metal, a very lightweight metal, but somebody should be fired. If this mission is cut short when they've got a nuclear power, it's nuclear power, this thing could go on forever. Not forever, but for a very long time. And we're worried about the wheels. It drives me insane. Look at these things. They're pretty beat up. Um, Paul McLeod on here, he did a video a little while back. NASA's covering up the real damage to the wheels. I think that's going to be most likely what ends up halting the mission. And hopefully we end up getting to the mountain first and start moving on up it before that happens. But we're going to have to play that one out and see. So... All right, and the last one here, this was a, uh, I think this was the, I forget the guy's name who, who put this out, um, but this has been on a couple websites. The giant UFO harvesting energy from the sun. Er, no, sorry. Just to hit peace, they always, that's funny how, at least this stuff's going mainstream, but YouTube's so big now, and we're hitting so many people that they feel, people feel they need to actually write these videos, which is pretty good to me. I think that we're, that means we're making a statement, we're, we're making progress. People are seeing this stuff and saying, whoa, I mean, that's kind of weird. What's going on with that? And I'm not sure if this, they said, this, they might be absolutely right on this, you know, but, but this was a very interesting thing. So a set of mysterious photographs, pictures of the sun uploaded to NASA's servers have caused a fury. 
fewer <laughs> in the UFO hunting community for showing what has been interpreted as a giant alien ship sucking life from our star. Needless to say, NASA isn't convinced, and neither are we. So what is it? First, let's take a look at the view of UFO sightings daily, which are convinced that there's something unnatural at play. That's Scott Waring's website over there. He's put some of my stuff up before, and I appreciate it. Every time he does it, I get a lot of hits. Um, it shows a massive disk over the sun. If you look carefully, you'll see a small stream of energy twisting as going up to the UFO, the site writes. Hey, our harvesting energy from the sun. You know, that's funny. The, this is helping to post. You really need to start, like, like, ah, like proofreading your stuff. I'm sure you say they are harvesting from the sun, <laughs> energy from the sun. Aliens may have high tech, but advanced civilizations with advanced tech and extremely high energy demands to meet. This is one way to get that need met. Unfortunately, for the UFO hunters searching the skies for Mars apes and alien supermen, there are probably one or two simpler explanations. <laughs> Excuse me. That's just a. That's just a very. See how they do it? See how they're there? It's just demeaning how they act towards this community. When the people I met in this community are ten times smarter than the people I meet out in the general public that this stuff is written for. The first is the picture might be showing a coronal mass ejection, a relatively regular occurrence, similar to a flare in which the sun belches a huge amount of energy in one go, which would not be unexpected during solar maximum or heightened period of activity currently cycling through. Which also, if you watch Space News uh, a little while ago, solar maximum is that actually has really any sunspots right now. And it's very, the sun, what's going on in the sun, it, it's, it's extremely quiet right now, which is unusual. The other is that the UFO and compression fault in the image. NASA has presented evidence that this compression causes weird anomalies in its images before. Dr. Joe German at NASA said another controversy, including images sent by the stereo spacecraft, that what you're seeing is the difference between beacon mode, nearly real-time, heavy compressed, binned images, and normal playback telemetry image. It's tricky to know exactly what's happening in the image, particularly as the links in the UFO sighting story don't go straight to the image in question, but a set of slightly different pictures. Don't lose any sleep over it, though. Um, so there's a nice little hit piece there. If you go, here's the actual thing that's going on. Um, it, this is, I forget what? the guy's name. This is died. I know if I pull it up, I can find the guy's name who does this. His channel, he's, his channel's huge. He puts out a lot of stuff. But this thing has a little tail coming from it. Interesting stuff. But I, what I thought about it, what I was looking at, is the whole hit piece of it and how the general public reacts and how stuff gets written for the masses. And let me tell you what. I even though, uh, you know, we may be ape, Mars ape, and alien Superman looking people. Uh, when you put us in a room with other people, I can have an intelligent conversation with the majority of people. And <laughs> believe me, buddy, I, I would rather sit and talk to them than sit and talk to the general public that doesn't even know, you know, where New York City is. <laughs> so much love, guys. What's up in the sky .com, www What's up in the sky .com. Check out the website. My name is Will. Hope you enjoyed Space News. We're going to keep on moving this forward. Hopefully, maybe I'll get some graphics and stuff like that to do. Um, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, but I always want to share the videos with you that I find are the articles I find interesting, to say the least. Um, all these will be linked down in the description if you want to go check these out. Much love to you. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take it easy. 18 minutes and 16 seconds in. Peace.